one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. This is Radio Free Mormon on the air, broadcasting behind enemy lines. Tonight's episode, my Ask Me Anything on Mormon Reddit. But before we get to the subject of tonight's podcast, I have a special announcement to make. Bill Reel and I have been concerned over the last several months, actually, as to the theme song of Radio Free Mormon. Five years ago now, I came up with the idea of Radio Free Mormon, and I simply asked Bill if he knew of any kind of martial music that might be good. He searched through the internet. He came up with a great song. It was a song I'd never heard before. It was a song he'd never heard before, but it worked perfectly, and that has been the intro music for Radio Free Mormon ever since. It was only some years after we started using it that I found out that the name of the song is Simper Paratus. It is, in fact, the Coast Guard hymn. But the problem with the version that we've been using is that it is copyrighted. And so it's something that we cannot put up, at least not on YouTube, without getting flagged. So as things have continued to expand at Mormon Discussions, Bill thought that it would be a good idea if we could get some other kind of music. He came up with a few kinds of non-copyrighted music which were really, really bad or at least I should say insufficient for our needs. One of them was just a snare drum beating out a staccato tattoo. And actually, I think that was the best one of all those that Bill could find that were not copyrighted. So we came up with the idea of having a contest because I said, you know, we have a lot of talented listeners out there and I'll bet some of them would be able to come up with a version of the same hymn, Semper Paratus, which is obviously not a copyrighted song because of its age, but could do it in a different version that would not be copyrighted like the version we have been using for five years. So Bill put out the word, asked for contributions. Several of you listeners rushed into the fray and created different versions of the same hymn. And all of them were very, very good. They were so much better than the non-copyrighted materials that Bill was able to find and which we had summarily rejected. Ultimately, Bill put them in a blind test for me, not a blind taste test, but a blind hearing test so I could hear the different versions that had been submitted. After a very difficult process, I ended up picking one version, which I thought would be a really good opening and closing song for the show. The reason the process was so difficult is because all of the contributions were so good. And I actually jumped the gun and used it in my last RFM podcast as the opening and closing hymn of sorts, the intro and the outro music. Technically, it is a hymn, so it is the opening and closing hymn. Actually, it is the Coast Guard hymn. The listener who supplied and put together and created this version that I am now using in this show and will be using in future shows is none other than Mike Hardy. Mike, thank you so much. Congratulations on submitting the winning selection. Thank you to everybody who contributed your time and talents in this competition. And I don't even like the word competition because that suggests that there are winners and losers. I really appreciate all of you. I am thankful for your support, your time, your willingness to engage in this podcast and to help out when we come to a tough spot in the road and we're not sure whether we should go right or whether we should go left. Thank you to everybody. Thank you to Mike Hardy. Thank you to the Coast Guard. And now, on with tonight's show. On Friday, February 18th, 2022, I was asked by the good people at Mormon Reddit to do an Ask Me Anything session, which I was happy to agree to. It started at 8 o'clock a.m. Mountain Time and went for three hours. By the time it was over, my fingers were very tired from typing. This was made only more difficult by the fact that, for whatever reason, I could only access a certain limited number of questions on my computer. And once I had answered those questions, I went and looked at my iPhone on Mormon Reddit and I saw that there were a whole lot more questions that were appearing on my iPhone than were appearing on the computer. I have no idea why that was the case, but what it meant was that I had to type out my responses to all those additional questions, not on my computer keyboard, but on my iPhone. And you can understand why that would make it more challenging. Nevertheless, I think I managed to answer all of the questions that were thrown at me and I want to go over some of those questions and the answers I gave on the AMA in this podcast podcast to preserve it for posterity and hopefully make it more accessible to a wider audience. The first question was, Hi RFM, I just wanted to tell you how much your podcast meant to me in my faith transition period. It was an isolating time and your podcast was a huge comfort. I especially enjoyed the apostolic coup d'etat episodes. Blew my mind. And then the question, I am curious how your relationship with your daughter is going. My response, thanks so much. 
As to my family relationships, I don't want to get into a lot of detail for probably obvious reasons. Suffice it to say, this month marks four years since she has cut off contact with me. Glad you enjoy the podcast. One of the responses to my answer was, that sucks. It's interesting how family is essential to the plan of salvation until one of those family members doesn't toe the line. Another question was, RFM, what is your favorite movie of all time and why? My response, Casablanca. Why? It's the romantic in me. I put that in quotation marks because, of course, that is a line from the movie. It's the romantic in me. One of the responses to my answer was, I hope Pee-wee's Big Adventure at least makes the top five. Yes, it definitely does. I just want to assure you, Pee-wee's Big Adventure is up there. Possibly the funniest movie I have ever seen in my entire life. I remember that when I watched it for the first time back in the 1980s, I started laughing at the opening scene and I did not stop laughing until the final credits. That's a funny movie. This commenter goes on, It makes me so sad when you quote Pee-wee and Bill has no idea what you are talking about. Well, to be fair, I think that if Bill or anybody else does not get my references to Pee-wee's Big Adventure, I'm not sure if that says something more negative about them or about me. Next question. Hi, RFM. I love your podcasts. Mormonism Live is good, but your traditional podcast episodes really speak to me. Any chance you are thinking of doing more of the traditional podcasts in the future? I know Mormonism Live takes time. My answer, new RFM podcasts resumed at the beginning of this year. Check it out. Thanks for your interest. The next question, why the name Radio Free Mormon? My answer, I came up with the name years before the podcast started. First, I wanted a name that didn't start with Mormon because there was already a glut of those on the market. Mormon stories, Mormon expression, Mormon discussions. You get the idea. It is, of course, a riff on Radio Free Europe, which was established at the beginning of the Cold War to transmit uncensored news and information to audiences behind the Iron Curtain. This next question is extremely long in detail, so I'm going to edit it a bit on the fly. Hey, RFM, got a good one for you. If God himself showed up, and you were able to verify he was truly God by shaking his hand, and he told you the following are true, and then he gives a whole list of strange things about Mormonism, which God is, in this hypothetical, telling me are true. The Garden of Eden is in Missouri. The earth is only 6,000 years old. God really did drown everyone except Noah's family and Cain. Nephites, Lamanites invented the Sierra Club motto, Leave No Trace. Ether took bees on a year-long transoceanic voyage in a wooden submarine. All renditions of the first vision are true and accurate. A peepstone has a better Bluetooth radius than the Urim and Thummim. An angel really did command Joseph Smith to marry teenagers. Zelf and Onandagus held PPIs together on the grassy plains of North America. Osiris really is Abraham and men. Well, he's got all the key words. By the way, that men is capital M-I-N, the creator god of the Egyptians. Osiris really is Abraham and men. Skin color is a sign of righteousness, and it can change accordingly. Moroni dedicated the land for the Manti Temple. Blood atonement is doctrine. Adam God theory is doctrine. Using the word Mormon hurts God's feelings. Kolob is the greatest of all the Kokalbiam. There's a TK smoothie with my name on it. And he was okay with so many other horrific facts and discriminatory policies that the church endorses due to revelation. Actually, I didn't end up editing those on the fly. I read all of them because once I started getting into them, they were so funny and well-worded. So here's the hypothetical. God shows up. I verify it really is God by shaking his hand. He tells me that all of those things are true. Then the question is, would you A, begin to include the moon quakers in your prayers, B, purchase a divining rod, C, name your next child, Mahan Rai Moriankamer, D, finally tell us the truth about your second anointing. Then this poster says, just kidding, in all seriousness, the real question is, if these things are all true, is this a God and a religion you want to be associated with? On a personal note, he concludes, Thank you for what you do. Your insight, knowledge, and humor are much appreciated, and you've been an incredible help to more people than you know. My answer, great question. I think the sad answer is the LDS Church isn't worth being a member of, even if it were true, and that is saying something. 
Next question. Also, RFM, your Milk Skimmings episode was the first I listened to, and I was hooked. You've been a great friend, albeit a virtual one, LOL, as I've muddled through my faith transition and figured things out. Thanks for all you do. My answer, you are so welcome. I like that episode too. The episodes I like best are those where my research allows me to make a substantive contribution to Mormon studies. And I think the possibility that Thomas Marsh's wife, Elizabeth, lost her church court case with Lucinda Harris over the issue of milk strippings because Lucinda was a secret plural wife of Joseph Smith's. I think that possibility to be intriguing. Thanks for the kind words. Next question, RFM, my question is about all the sexual innuendo in your Mormonism live banter with Bill. It's harder and harder not to notice when you keep putting it in there. Bill always plays dumb, and it comes to the point where the jokes just peter out. It might make for a more satisfying show if you didn't ride the single comedy trope so hard. I mean, you could insert some other joke types in from time to time and pull out the innuendo. I do think you're brilliant, witty, and funny, but don't think I'm just stroking your ego. Wow, I've used up a lot of space, but didn't even come to my deeper question. I've already said a mouthful, so I won't make it any longer. My response, LOL. This is a classic example of why I am justified in saying I have the smartest audience members of any podcast out there. Yes, I saw what you did there. Another commenter said, RFM routinely makes me laugh. I love his jokes. I replied, that makes two of us. Another commenter says, in general, I think the content of the show is really great. Occasionally, the humor makes me cringe a bit, though. My response, there is an old saying among lawyers that if all of your objections are getting sustained, you aren't objecting enough. I think something along those lines applies here. I know sometimes I make some people cringe. That isn't my goal. But just think how you would feel about all the things I don't say. And of course, someone had to ask the question, RFM, have you received the second anointing? And of course, I had to respond, I have been counseled not to share my most sacred experiences in public. Wow, that one looks like it has 77 likes. Another poster asks, RFM, could you put out a call for church headquarter insider leaks? It could be an element or feature on your show in which you share the latest info from moles. Could be substantive stuff or even just entertaining stuff. My response, I honestly get contacted with a good deal of intel without specifically asking for it. Remember the floor plans of a new temple showing the washroom directly adjoining the ceiling room for the second anointing? I am happy to receive any intel from any source but would consider it somewhat gauche to put out a request for such intel. I hope that makes sense to you. That answer got this response. You rock. I love the term gauche. And I love your free use of more obscure $10,000 words on your shows. Another question. You seem like someone that likes to talk with people. A very social being. Do you miss the social aspect of full LDS church activity? Have you been able to replace this in a post-Mormon context? What advice do you have for others who feel isolated in a post-Mormon world? My answer, in retrospect, I see that almost all my church friendships were, like Mormon doctrine, a mile wide and an inch deep. I do not miss them. The friendships I find in the post-Mormon context are much better and more authentic. I desire all to receive it. Next question. Hi, RFM. I haven't yet listened to all your podcasts, but I'm slowly working on them. And I love your live ones and your interactions with listeners. I want to say thank you as your podcasts helped pull me out of a dark place after being given the miracle of forgiveness and being blamed by people I trusted. I stumbled on your stuff through a random Reddit comment after being banned from an LDS sub trying to ask a question hoping to find a way to stay in the church. Your podcasts and just everything you've done has helped me realize I'm not alone. And a lot of the church is imperfect. So, my question, who is your favorite modern author? And what is the book you would recommend that everyone read? My answer, modern author? I have a soft spot in my heart for Stephen King. He's not the best in the world, but I've been with him from the beginning and have read everything he has written. His best work is his earliest. You can skip Carrie because it's kind of rough, but definitely shows his promise. Then everything after that until It 
where he starts jumping the shark, and Tommy Knockers, where he misses the landing. It's been kind of hit and miss since. And then this response to my answer. This response made me so happy because I love Stephen King. My favorites of his are Salem's Lot, oh absolutely I agree with that, Salem's Lot and Needful Things. I adore the horror genre, and he was my first foray into it, so I will always have a soft spot for him as well, even though his newer stuff is meh. Next question, RFM, just so you know, I am laughing at home all the time. The jokes and references are landing for the audience, even when they aren't landing with Bill. (laughs) His silence makes me laugh even harder sometimes. And no, it's not an age thing. I'm still in my 30s. Thank you for your hard work and time. It is greatly appreciated. So much so that you are the first podcaster that I make a monthly donation to. Thank you. My response, thank you so much. It's good to know my jokes are landing somewhere, even if it's only an airstrip on a small island in the Pacific. Next question. Hey, RFM, fellow attorney here. I've always been curious about your professional career. Has anyone that you have encountered in your professional career ever recognized you as Radio Free Mormon? My answer, not to my recollection, but then Mormon lawyers aren't exactly common in my neck of the woods. Next question, what are three actions you would take if you became BYU president tomorrow? Answer, I don't know if I can come up with three off the top of my head, but I can sure come up with one. Stop penalizing students for their sexual preference or orientation. Stop penalizing students for losing faith in Mormonism. Prioritize and promote professors based on excellence in their field rather than their religious beliefs. I guess I could come up with three off the top of my head after all. Question, would you have gotten into podcasting without the help of Bill Reel? Or was it inevitable? It would have just taken you longer. My answer, Bill Reel was indispensable. I had thought about it for a couple of years, i.e. doing a podcast, but didn't know how to get started. It seemed hopelessly confusing to me. Bill reached out to me and very patiently showed me the ropes. It was very difficult at first, but Bill was there to help me at every stage. I owe it all to him. Question. For your information, your Do the Brethren Speak with God episode was instrumental in saving my marriage. I think that might actually be the one where I ask, have LDS apostles really seen Jesus Christ? I think that might be the episode they're talking about. I don't recognize one by the title of Do the Brethren Speak with God, but regardless, it was instrumental in saving my marriage. It was the first podcast episode my wife was willing to listen to after we attended a mixed faith couples retreat and it opened the floodgates. You are my favorite member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I got to say, that's saying something when I've got competition from people like David Bednar. I'm eternally grateful that the gift of the Holy Ghost is guiding your words and actions as manifest in your podcast. Do you ever let fans take you out for breakfast and a coffee when they are passing through your neck of the woods? My wife is not on Reddit, but told me to ask for her. If you have a plan on doing an episode on interrelatedness or nepotism in the top ranks of the church. My answer, thanks for the kind words. I am always up for a free meal. Nepotism is natural in a small insular organization like Mormonism was for its first century. I'm not sure they have figured out they don't need to do it anymore. Someone then asked a question as to why it was I was still a member of the church and why I had not resigned. My answer, The main reason I am still a member is not because the church holds anything of value to me, but more because after everything I have been through, I am not going to go gently into that good night. Raging against the dying of the light is more my style. Question, are you anticipating that the church will attempt to excommunicate you? My answer, when and if it happens, I will be shocked but not surprised. Next question, RFM, have LDS ever found any example of the translation abilities of Joseph Smith, which the source material still exists and is verified as a correct translation? Thank you for your program, by the way. It has been eye-opening. My answer, not to my knowledge, which is why the Book of Abraham is such a problem. Any place Joseph's prophetic abilities can be tested, he fails spectacularly which should tell us something about those places where he can't be tested. Next question. Hi, RFM. I'm a huge fan and have listened to most, if not all, of your episodes. 
I've noticed you have not done an episode completely dedicated to the temple endowment and other temple ceremonies. I have heard you make mentions about certain aspects of it, but not anything too detailed or too much mention of its connections with masonry. Is that because of a respect for believers and not wanting to offend them? Or have you just not gotten around to it? I would love to hear you dissect the history of the endowment and its connections to masonry. I would especially like to hear your take on the poor apologetics surrounding this topic. My answer, I may yet get to the issue of masonry. There is so much to say and explore regarding Mormonism, isn't there? I mean, after you liberate yourself from the constraints of the correlated curriculum, I do want to be sensitive regarding those aspects considered sacred by others. I think that is important. On the other hand, I can usually get my point across without being explicit, as long as the person I'm talking to has been through the temple themselves. By the way, I also don't condone shooting pornography movies in the temple. LOL. Next question, RFM, I too want to thank you for having such a positive way of dealing with these problems. Your humor and wit has helped so many people. It's helpful because it is not vindictive. I've been to the local Thrive a couple of times and I've met several people in a small setting who have told the group that you have helped them. They specifically mention RFM. Mormon stories is good, but the anger can be felt there. I think you and Bill make a great team, but he clearly shows his angst toward the church. But somehow, you always remain fun, comical, and informative, which is such a positive outlook and example for people who are going through a faith transition. So thank you. Also, have you done anything on Joseph Smith's connection with Dartmouth University? My answer, I like to think I am a good influence on Bill, though in actuality, I played an inadvertent part in getting him exed by bringing to his attention a particular prefer- <laughs> by bringing to his attention a particular prevarication by a certain Irish apostle. Question: What was personally the most shocking piece of church history you learned? My answer: That they made Ronald Pullman re-record his conference talk in 1984 and then pretended the first talk was never given. It was one of those things where you scratch your head and say, "Just when I thought I'd heard it all." One of the posters asked the question, for those of us who don't know this story, i.e. about Ronald Pullman, for those of us who don't know this story, what happened in the first one? Another poster was good enough to answer that question. He, Ronald Pullman, gave a speech in conference that could have been interpreted as saying that as you get more righteous, you don't need the church so much. They made him rewrite it, then printed the changed version in the enzyme, and also they had him go back to the tabernacle and record the new version with a cough track. (coughs) and cut it into the official conference recording tape. Next question. Hi, RFM. First, I want to thank you so much for all the work you do for the community. I am a huge fan of your personal podcast, and it has had a significant impact on my life. I really enjoy your work with Mormonism Live, but your podcast and Lindsay Hansen Park's Year of Polygamy are my two absolute favorite podcasts in the space and have changed everything for me. I'm sure you hear it a lot, but I just want to let you know that your podcast has made my life better. So, questions for you. What plans do you have for Mormonism Live to incorporate Maven more? I know she has joined the show initially to help with the technical side of things, but the unmasking of Maven, that was the title of the episode where she came out from behind the curtain and we were able to talk to her about her story, which was actually made possible at that point because she had finally come out to her parents as being someone who wasn't believing anymore. So we had to wait for that to happen in order to have that episode. But this question goes on, but the unmasking of Maven was possibly my favorite Mormonism Live episode. I'm really excited for her contributions to the show. If there was one question you could ask Joseph Smith, what would you ask him? My answer, thanks for your kind words. Maven is really amazing. She is bright, witty, and articulate and has a vast knowledge base about Mormonism. Even when her face isn't showing on the screen, she is very busy behind the scenes making everything happen. Like theater people know, the most important person in a show isn't anybody on the stage. It is the stage manager whom the audience never sees. Maven is an incredible stage manager, but she is also a great personality. She can do it all. But she can't do it all at the same time. She is such a great personality, in fact, that things are at work behind the scenes to develop her own podcast. Stay tuned. Oh, and then Maven chimed in. 
She says, Maven chiming in here. This is exactly correct. One of my favorite parts of being on the show is to see how much easier it is for Bill and RFM to interact on the show and host guests when Bill doesn't have to also be watching comments and getting everything else ready. If I were to be a full-time host, we'd need someone else to fill in on the behind-the-scenes stuff, and also the podcast would probably end up being twice as long. And then someone responds to Maven. Thank you, Maven. I hope you've received mostly positive comments to your unmasking, but want to thank you for your contribution to the show and to this crazy world of all of us trying to navigate what Mormonism and post-Mormonism means to us individually. Your background is somewhat similar to mine, so it really resonated to me that you were willing to step somewhat outside your comfort zone and be a public part of this show. As you told your story, I got a little teary-eyed as I relived some of my own experiences. Good luck with your journey, whether you decide to branch out and contribute more publicly or continue to ensure that Mormonism Live continues smoothly. I think we are all very excited about what you can uniquely bring to the community. Well, I just want to echo everything that that commenter said about Maven. The next question was, I think, to me because I never got around to answering the part of the question that said, what would you like to most ask Joseph Smith if you had the opportunity? And I was reminded by this poster who said, if you have a minute, my unrelated follow-up question, if there was one question you could ask Joseph Smith, perhaps about some unexplained mystery or just insight into his personality, what would you ask him? My response was, his best pickup line? And the response to my answer was, considering his success rate, I can certainly understand the value in knowing the answer. Thanks. Next question, would you like to get excommunicated? Why do you think you haven't been excommunicated? My answer, we had a member of my stake presidency on the Mormonism Live show a few months back to answer that very question of why I haven't been excommunicated. I suppose the short answer is, local leaders don't deem me that big a threat, and top leaders haven't put out a hit on me yet. Being excommunicated is not something I would like. I am not courting it. If I were courting it, I would say something like, oh, I don't know, liar, liar, pants on fire, about one of the apostles, LOL. On the other hand, I am not shrinking from it either. There is nothing I value that the church can take away from me. If the big brass in Salt Lake want me off the membership rolls, they know how to find me. I'll leave the light on. Question, what is your favorite podcast episode that you produced and why? My answer, wrong roads, because it is Bill's favorite and he has good taste. Follow-up question, what is your favorite church podcast episode that you were not involved in? My answer was General Conference Death March. And same reason. Now, this is my fault because I misread the question. Just now when I'm reading it for purposes of this podcast, I see there's a not in there. What is your favorite church podcast episode that you are not involved in? And I didn't see the not. So I I said General Conference Death March. Obviously, I was very much involved in that. In fact, that was exclusively me on Radio Free Mormon. That's the sort of thing that can happen when you are racing on a small phone to answer questions as quickly as possible. Next question, similar to the prior question, if the Q15 came to you today and said, RFM, tell us what to do. What do we need to change about the church? What three or more things would you suggest? Secondly, if they implemented all of your suggestions, would you return to activity in the church? My answer is, this is you, Elder Ballard, isn't it? Okay, here you go. The first thing you need to do is tell the truth. And the second is like unto it. Be honest. Follow the teachings of the church you promote over the pulpit for the members, but you seem to have a hard time following yourselves. Third, start apologizing for the harmful things you have done, the lies you have told, the deceptions you have perpetuated. And not just for yourselves, but for the church as an institution. While you're at it, Start using your vast wealth to help people. And when you do, resist the urge to make a PR announcement about it. Right now, all that wealth is just cankering your souls. You can feel it, can't you? The original questioner comes back and says, Thanks for the response to the first part. What about the second part? If we, oops, I mean they, implement these changes, will you come back to activity? And my answer, not a chance. Next question. Hey, RFM, here's a bit of a false dichotomy. Because there are more than just these two options, 
But if you had to pick the more likely outcome, do you think it's more likely the church will slowly fade into nothing or that it will change for the better and become a more open, honest, and healthy place for its members? As a follow-up, is it worth our time as post and ex-Mormons to try to advocate for reform? If you answer no, you might find my subreddit to be pointless. If you answer yes, please check out the subreddit titled Mormon Movements. Thanks for all your work. Keep it up. My answer, I don't think the church will fade into nothing, but I do think it will continue to shrink. It is sort of like a collapsing star at this point, that it's going to keep getting smaller, but as it does so, the heavier elements will be left, making it denser. And by denser, I mean more fundamentalist and orthodox. I think that, at the same time, the church will slowly and painfully open up to be more honest and healthy, but this will be at least 20 years behind when they should have done so, and will be too little too late for the many members who will already have ridden off into the sunset by the time the church gets around to making the changes that could have held them in. I think advocating for reform publicly is one of the only ways the members have to get the leadership to understand they need to do something about the situation. They seem to care more about their public image than about the welfare of the members. Boy, is that an understatement. Next question. If you could describe Joseph Smith in five sentences, what would you say? This is something I struggled with. This continues the question. This is something I struggled with and am still trying to work through. He was my hero at one point, and then I felt so betrayed when I found out about Fanny Alger and other young girls in foster-daughter relationships with him. He was a great leader, but made lots of poor decisions. I can't figure out if he was being strung along by the stronger men around him, like Sidney Rigdon and John C. Bennett, or if Joseph was actually in charge of the way everything went down. What are your thoughts on him? My answer, let me borrow something I heard on a podcast a few years back that really resonated with me. The person speaking, whose name I don't remember, sorry, was into Buddhism and believed in an individual being able to receive communications from the universe. This person said that he felt Joseph Smith was really in contact with something outside himself during the early years of his ministry. But by the end of his ministry, Joseph got to the point where he couldn't distinguish those communications from outside himself from the thoughts in his own head. Here's another take. Dan Vogel proposes Joseph Smith was a pious fraud. I suggest maybe Joseph Smith was a sincere fraud. This theory posits that although Joseph Smith used fraud to influence others and gain followers, and that Joseph Smith knew he was using fraud, he eventually came to the point where he convinced not only his followers, but also convinced himself. It's like in The Music Man, where Harold Hill, a fraudster through and through, nevertheless tells little Winthrop after he has been found out, I always think there's a band, kid. I think that one poignant line may have a lot of application to Joseph Smith. Is it possible for him to have been a fraud and yet say, I always think there's a set of gold plates, kid? I think so. The human mind is an amazing place. And one of the responses to my answer was, Thank you, this is such a good perspective, and you articulated exactly what I have been trying to sort out in my head. Once again, you have proven to be simply the best. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Next question, RFM. I cannot thank you enough for all of your podcasts. They have been invaluable to me. My only question is how you maintained your cool during the Midnight Mormons debate. My answer, Valium. The follow-up to that was, I want to sincerely thank you for your example during that debate. There was only one person on that stage that displayed maturity, wisdom, and Christ-like kindness up there, and he wasn't on the church's side. Way to rise above, even when Kwaku sank lower than low. My answer to that was, Kwaku is my brother from another mother. Question, will you give us your RFM mixtape playlist? Top 15 or so songs of all time for you. Thanks for all you do and love your podcasts. You truly make a huge impact in this little niche of the world. My answer, I will absolutely do that, though I am not sure how to do it here. Here's one that I can't not dance to. Me and Julio by Paul Simon. When the radical priests come and get me released, we was all on the cover of Newsweek. Brilliant. Next question. Hi, RFM. Thanks for taking the time to answer our questions with us today. I loved your podcast about Joseph and his use of the hat during Book of Mormon translation as a smokescreen to hide previously copied or written notes to read off to scribes. 
The Magician and His Tricks episode. I listened to Bill Reel's earlier podcast when he had a faithful approach and said it was too dark in most of the settings he was in to read these notes, let alone inside a hat covering your face from any external light. Any thoughts on how he still could have pulled that off? My answer, it was Bill who tripped me to the fact Joseph's hat was white and translucent. Maybe the podcast you mentioned was before Bill made that discovery. Next question. Hey, RFM. Thank you for all of your wise words and insight. Your analysis of the Joseph Bishop case is what broke my shelf. Realizing that the church only cares about itself and will throw anyone it needs to under the bus to protect it was beyond appalling. My question for you today is, is there any way that we could vote for RFM's best podcasts and have a compilation CD or other means of compiling the top 10 podcasts for those new to following you or for those of us who want to keep your wise words in perpetuity? Maybe consider transcribing them and compiling them into a book. I'd buy it. My answer was pretty short, which was, this is a very interesting idea and one I will bring up with my producer. Thanks. Now, that answer is very short. I can elaborate it on it just a bit more. There is a listener to the show who went ahead and with my permission, and I don't even know if permission was needed, transcribed my very first podcast from five years ago. The idea now is for me to review that podcast transcription and make any edits that I feel are necessary. I'm not exactly sure what's going to ultimately happen with it, but I do know that it has been weeks, if not months now, that I've been meaning to get around to reviewing that transcription. And I apologize right now for not having gotten to it sooner. There are just so many things to do and so little time. But it may be that something along those lines is actually in the work. So great question. And maybe something will happen to where we do have a compilation of Radio Free Mormon podcast transcripts. Next question. Hey, RFM. Thanks for all you do. Question. What kind of afterlife or heaven do you find yourself believing in these days? Is there anything after we die? My answer A well-deserved nap, I hope. Next question. Have you dipped your toes into ex-Mormon subreddit? Lots of love for you there, too. Now, once again, this is on the Mormon Reddit where I'm doing the Ask Me Anything. The ex-Mormon Reddit is a different subreddit, and I believe this AMA was advertised there, too, as well. My answer was, I have only dipped my toes there, as well as here, for that matter. I confess to doing regular vanity searches in both places to find out what people are saying about me, though. Next question. Hey, RFM, have you seen this? And then there's a link to what is apparently a comprehensive list of false, contradictory, or unethical statements by prophets. They go on, just wanted to know if you'd seen it and maybe get your opinion on whether it's a useful tool for people. My answer, I generally don't like long lists because they often include less persuasive examples to increase the number. With the result, the opposition can deconstruct the least persuasive examples and act like they have responded to the whole thing. A few well-selected strong examples are more powerful than a long list, in my opinion, at least as a general proposition. The response to my answer was, I agree with you that some long lists include very weak examples that are fodder for apologists. This is counterproductive. Because of that, I stuck with very narrow inclusion criteria, e.g. only verifiably false statements on pages 12 through 20. This list only happens to be so long because LDS leaders have, unfortunately, said so many verifiably false things. I encourage you to check it out sometime and see if you agree. Well, I will definitely check it out at some point. I'm just sorry that I have not had the chance to do so as of this point. Next question. Hi, RFM. As a fellow attorney, your podcast style really resonates with me. I especially enjoyed your earlier work, 2018 to 19 timeframe, as it helped me finally make peace with the fact that the church I was raised in and gave so much money for is not true, and its leaders are not inspired or inspiring. My question for you today is, why do you think issues like the use of a seer stone gets more attention and critique than the irrefutable DNA evidence that Lamanites don't even exist. I just finished reading Origin, A Genetic History of the Americas, and with all the new advances in this area, it is obvious the Book of Mormon is fiction. What do you think? My answer, I think that seer stones are more provoking than DNA because they are weirder, more dramatic, and easier to understand without having to dig into a lot of scientific details people aren't generally interested in. Glad the shows were of use to you. 
Next question. As I started studying LDS history and theology with an open mind rather than the conclusion predetermined, I have often asked, how could things have gotten this far? As in, how could the problems have been ignored for so long and church teachings drifted so far from the historical record? Recently, I have been reading Richard Carrier's On the Historicity of Jesus. In spite of Carrier's penchant for explaining himself so well as to obscure his actual point, it is a fascinating book that applies Bayes' probability theory to historical, or claimed historical, events. In doing so, he provides substantial contextual information that couches the Jesus narrative from the Bible within a coherent mythical tradition. My new question now supplants and undermines the previous. How could Christianity have gotten to the point that anyone takes it as historical fact? And now he gets to the questions he wants me to answer, I believe. Do you view Christ as a historical figure, mythologized historical figure, or a purely mythical character? The application of myth with respect to Joseph Smith and the LDS Church is a topic for another time. Okay, so my answer to this is, one of the things that surprised me about Mormon history was in researching the transfiguration of Brigham Young, and how quickly this event, that was mentioned by nobody at the time, nevertheless became invented and repeated and accepted as historical fact within several decades. This made me look with new eyes at the New Testament, I can tell you, because even the earliest gospel was written down several decades after Jesus died. Next question, do you realize how important you are to us? My answer, I will always underestimate my importance to anyone and everyone. It's how I'm built. You don't tend to go through 40 years of Mormonism and come out the other side with a great self-image. That said, I was overwhelmed last November at Thrive in Salt Lake City by the number of listeners who came up to me in the lobby to express their appreciation and tell me what a difference I had made in their lives. So many also told me that they love Mormonism Live but miss my RFM podcasts. That is when it occurred to me that I should make the leap of faith and begin the process of throttling down on the law practice, which I have done for 32 years now and start shifting time over to the RFM podcast again. I have produced about four new RFM podcasts so far this year and have another one in the works about the Brad Wilcox imbroglio. By the way, just for my listeners, I have spent my life, or at least that part of my life ever since I learned this word imbroglio, mispronouncing it as imbroglio. But when I went to use it as the title for my podcast, the Brad Wilcox imbroglio, I decided I better look it up to make sure I was using it correctly, which I was actually, but unfortunately, I was mispronouncing it and had been doing so for my entire life, at least on those rare occasions when the word came up in casual conversation, which isn't that often. So actually, it is not imbroglio, it is imbroglio, and so I learned something new as part of the podcast. Just thought I'd pass it along for anybody who's interested. I conclude this answer by saying about my shifting time over to the RFM podcast and throttling back on the law practice, it is scary for me because I have to start really depending on donations from listeners. But like I say, it's an act of faith. Next question. Hey, RFM, with the surge in popularity of TikTok, have you and Bill considered starting a channel there? You wouldn't even have to make much new content. Just post clips of your best one-liners and short stories. My answer, we have thought about it, but no action has been taken in that regard yet. I have taken a few great TikTok videos that others have made about RFM and put them up on my Facebook page. It is possible that now that Bill has a little more time to devote to the show, he will be able to get something along those lines started. Next question, do donations to Radio Free Mormon only get used for RFM or are they spread across all of the shows, Mormonism Live and others? My answer, what is donated specifically to RFM goes to RFM. We don't split up the tips. Next question. Hey, RFM. People on Reddit often ask for a list of your best episodes when they first discover you. Do you have a top five list that you would recommend for new listeners? My answer. The Great Church History Cover-Up, Wrong Roads, General Conference Death March, and Apostolic Coup d'etat. And that would be in no particular order, by the way. Next question, RFM, why do you feel that Elder Timothy J. Dykes was called to the Strengthening Church Members Committee, and what was he supposed to accomplish in that role? My answer, he was supposed to figure out who I am. Epic fail. 
The response to my answer was, you said that he said he believed he knew who you were and had a file on you, but he wouldn't say the name and neither would you. Did he make a guess as to your identity? My answer, yes. He thinks he knows who I am, but isn't quite sure. One commenter who did not ask a question said, it needs to be said you saved my sanity. I will forever be thankful. I did not respond to that comment in the AMA, but I will say here that I'm not sure whether I'm saving people's sanity so much as I'm saying it's time to embrace the madness. Next question, can you explain how the doctrine of exaltation has changed over time? Or has it changed at all? It seems to me it's been more the focus on it that has changed, but many claim the actual teachings themselves have changed. My response, well, one big change recently is the church wants the world to know Mormons won't be getting their own planets. What have I been cleaning church toilets for all these years? Very disappointing. Next question, I guess a follow-up would be, do you think the church is splitting hairs when denying the get-your-own-planet thing because it's an oversimplified explanation of the doctrine? Or do you think they're literally changing the meaning of exaltation? Because I was unquestionably taught that we would inherit all that God has, including the ability to have spirit children and creations of our own. This, to me, also seems to be plainly taught in both scriptures and words of past prophets. I'm curious what your take is on them taking this position. My answer, I think the church is trying to assure outsiders they're not as weird as they are. Next question, RFM, let's say you're the prophet and get to do all the things you've been dying to do for years. What are the top things you'd implement with the church under your stewardship? My answer, I have answered that upstream already, but this church needs an infusion of enthusiasm like nobody's business. Reverence is just another word for boring as hell. Every time I hear church members singing, I start looking for the body. This church needs an enema. That's good for starters. Next question. RFM, keep up the great work. I always look forward to your podcasts. A few questions. One, have you done any podcasts on the brass plates? This seems to be a major issue, but I haven't seen much content dedicated to it. Two, what are your thoughts on Shulam's Book of Mormon Geography? Have you considered doing a podcast dedicated to it? By the way, Shulam is the screen name of a person who is out as Paul Osborne, and he is extremely smart. He posts a lot of his theories, his conclusions, his evidence on a message board called Discuss Mormonism. And so this person who is asking this question obviously knows that I know Shulam. Number three, what are your favorite naturalistic explanations for the Book of Mormon? I loved your recent Magic and Mormonism podcasts. I found Ann Taves' theory to be very compelling. Would love to hear your thoughts on that. My answer, I haven't done anything on brass plates yet, but have covered brass balls on Mormonism Live. Shulam is one of the smartest people I know, but I have been so busy I haven't had time to acquaint myself with his new studies in this area. I look forward to it, though. And finally, I say, I think Joseph turned his God-given ability to tell stories about the ancient inhabitants of America into the Book of Mormon, which he perhaps naturally believed was as God-given as his storytelling ability. Next question, RFM, your podcasts were the perfect antidote to negotiating my faith crisis. Your wit and compassion helped negate the angst and dark night of the soul moments, and your knowledge cleared the way for me to heal. Many thanks. My answer, you are so welcome. The dark night of the soul is just a little better when you know a friend with a candle. Next question, any thought to having other guests on from outside the LDS corridor, such as John Hadjacek? Or histor- and I don't know that I'm pronouncing that correctly, but I'm giving my best shot. John Hadjicek, H-A-J-I-C-E-K. Or historians from the Church of Christ, or excuse me, Community of Christ, or even the head, it's down here as C-O-C. Or even the Hedrickite and Rigdonite, Bickertonite branches. Also, do you believe there are any historical revelations, pun intended, yet to come regarding Mormonism's past and founding? Example, the finding of the Joseph Smith papyrus, but maybe not as big as that. Anything carefully hidden that, although the grip may tighten, might slip through their fingers? My answer, great idea regarding guests outside Mormonism. Still working to get the author of a recent book on James Strang on the show. As to the second question, I believe there will yet be many great and glorious revelations to come forth regarding the LDS Church. Next question, hey RFM, fellow Texan here. Enjoy the pod and insight y'all provide. 53-year-old R.M., temple marriage, etc., left in 05 and resigned last year. How come you haven't resigned your membership yet? Just curious, as you seem to know it's all a fraud. 
Oh, and do you miss the food and barbecue in the great state of Texas? Thanks. My answer, when it comes to my membership in the church, I have no intention of making it easy for them to get rid of me, though I imagine they would appreciate it if I did. Next question, hi RFM, if you have to give your best bet, one, when will the church accept gay temple marriage? Two, when will women be ordained priesthood in the same way man does? My best bet for both is about 80 to 100 years from now. My answer, my guess is 24 years and 8 months, give or take. And by that, I have no special insight. I was just throwing out a, <laughs> a rather precise number in order to illustrate the fact that I have absolutely no idea as to when that's going to happen. I do expect it will happen at some point, but I've got no idea as to when, whether it's next year, whether it's five years, 10 years, or 100 years. I expect that it will happen when the LDS church can no longer afford to not have it happen. Next question, I know what Vogel, that's Dan Vogel, says about authorship of the Book of Mormon, but I can't escape the circumstantial evidence of the Spalding theory, especially his wife's letters, The Stuff from Mormonism Unveiled. Where do you stand on the Spalding theory? I think it has legs. I think Joseph and Oliver and Rigdon used his lost book as an outline, at least. Thoughts? In my opinion, all of Mormonism starts and stops with the great first fraud, or the first great fraud, the Book of Mormon. Thanks for all you do. My answer... Thanks so much. For me personally, I think the witnesses regarding the Spalding theory are probably unreliable as to what they say they read that corresponds to the Book of Mormon. I tend to see an argument from a missing manuscript to be on a par with an argument for missing archaeology, if you know what I mean. Next question, are you more Moriarty, Sherlock, or Matlock? My answer, the Napoleon of crime. <laughs> Which of course is my way of saying Moriarty because that is what Sherlock Holmes famously called Moriarty, the Napoleon of crime. And at least eight people gave me an upvote on that. Next question, RFM, is there anything the church could do that would cause you to proactively ask to be removed from the records? It's funny how that question keeps coming up in different forms. My answer, not likely. I've been close before, but resisted the temptation. I am really about not making it easy for them. Next question, hey RFM, you are the rock in my hat. Anyway, do you have any thoughts about fully restored gospel versus ongoing restoration in terms of people justifying changes in the church that contradict prior revelations? Thanks. Now, I did this AMA for three hours and it actually extended to about four hours, but it does appear that some people ask questions either that I missed the first time and I tried not to miss any or that were asked after that period closed and I wasn't answering questions anymore. So I do not have an answer that I wrote down to this. Yeah, I have some thoughts about it. I think the church is going through a sea change in how it's talking about revelation through Joseph Smith. When I was growing up in the church and for my first 30 years in the church and up through Gordon B. Hinckley in the church, it was very clear that the church taught that the restoration had occurred through Joseph Smith, that he was the prophet of the restoration, and that if any other issues needed to be dealt with, then God could come in and tinker with things or redirect things in small ways, but that the substantial and large body of revelation had been received through Joseph Smith. Now, all of a sudden, with President Nelson at the helm, he's changing things a lot. And we're seeing now this change from Joseph Smith is the prophet of the restoration to this is an ongoing restoration. And it seems to be a talking point to justify and provide a rationale for all the changes that President Nelson is making. Once again, his changes seem to me to be more hacking at the leaves of the problem than striking at the root. But I think it's very clear that President Nelson believes that these are revelations coming from God and this is what God wants him to do. Therefore, all the changes that he has made are about an ongoing restoration. It's also important for President Nelson to do this because many of the things that he's doing are throwing former prophets under the bus, an obvious example being the name of the church. Well, President Hinckley had said back in 1993 that Mormon was not the technical name of the church, but that it was what people called us anyway. We're not going to get them to change what they call us, so maybe we should make that word Mormon shine with additional luster. It was also President Hinckley, of course, who did the I'm a Mormon campaign, and later on we had the church doing the movie Meet the Mormons. So all of this cost untold millions of dollars in PR expenses, not to mention all the production expenses, hammering home the fact that we are Mormons. 
So now President Nelson comes along with one of his many gospel hobby horses that we need to refer to the name of the church by its full name and not call members Mormons. And he can't do that without throwing past prophets such as President Hinckley and their projects of I'm a Mormon campaign under the bus. And so therefore, I think that's why he has to talk about this as an ongoing restoration. Things that prior prophets didn't get right, but thank God he's here to set the record straight, to steady the ark, as it were. Those are some of my thoughts about the ongoing restoration, language that's beginning to crop up in the church, and I'm sure we'll hear about it at the next general conference in April. Next question. Hey, RFM, it's Stephen Pinnaker of Mormon Book Reviews here. As an evangelical, I'd like to know what do you think of Jesus? Who is Jesus to you? I'm about to tape an interview with Rock Waterman in a few, so if I don't respond to your answer right away, that's why. I've been listening to your podcast for a couple of years, and I really enjoy it. My answer, Jesus was an apocalyptic Jewish prophet who called his religious leaders out on their hypocrisy. I think that's a great quality worthy of emulation, as well as his focus on caring for the marginalized and dispossessed. As to claims regarding his divinity, atonement, and resurrection, these appear to be ideas developed later in order to account for why it was he was crucified when the true Messiah was not supposed to die. In a very real way, Christianity was created by the death of Jesus. Next question, RFM, have you ever had a particularly egregious WTF moment (laughs) during sacrament meeting when bringing an investigator to church? Example, one Sunday on my mission during a particularly bad dry spell for investigators, we finally convinced one to come to the branch. We had primed the leadership that we'd have someone there. The intermediate hymn was, if you could hide a kolob. They sang it standing up. They all stood up in unison, like good little Mormons. Needless to say, our investigator did not return. My answer, I took a non-member girl I knew to a fireside back in my early 20s, where a member of our state presidency spoke. He started off by asking if everybody had their scriptures. Because if you don't, he said, you're losers. I was so embarrassed, but covered by showing the girl my quad and mouthing to her, I'm not a loser. She smiled and mouthed back, I know you're not. And no, she never got baptized either. Next question, briefs or boxers? My answer, spandex. Next question, hey RFM, in your debate against midnight Mormons, what were your impressions of the bulletproof vests they wore? Secondly, did the vests have any plates or were they just empty? And an unrelated question, what's the best book that does a broad overview of Mormon history that doesn't shy away from the things the church doesn't like? My answer, I told Bill before the debate started that wearing those bulletproof vests was a perfect way to destroy their credibility before even opening their mouths. I didn't get close enough to feel their vests to know if they had plates. Maybe Moroni took them? Next question. I listened to you years ago on the Cultural Hall podcast talking about temple symbolism. What are your thoughts these days? My answer. I think the symbolism is still there, though I have to be cautious that some of what I see is generated in my own mind and not something that was necessarily intended. But then, isn't that what art is all about? Next question. Hey, RFM, have you heard of this? It's about the connections the Smiths had with Dartmouth University. Apparently, Ethan Smith and Solomon Spaulding went there too. And then there's a link to something on ex-Mormon Reddit. I did not have a chance to answer that. I apologize. Yes, I have heard about it. No, I have not been able to do a deep enough study to do a podcast on it. By the way, as a matter of disclosure, one of the things I have to fight against in doing podcasts is this feeling, this overpowering feeling that I have that I need to be an expert on a subject before I talk about it, that I have to have done exhaustive research on something and know it inside and out before I can do a podcast. And as I say, I do a great deal of research before every podcast, but on the other hand, I have to fight against the idea that I have to be an expert on a subject before recording anything, because otherwise, I would probably never record anything at all. I've had to come to the realization and reinforce it upon myself that just because I don't know everything about a subject doesn't mean that I have nothing of value to say about that subject. This is a variation on what I think it's Elder Holland said. It might be Elder Oaks. I get this too confused for some reason. You may have noticed that. They don't look anything alike. They don't sound anything alike. But for some reason, I've got this this synapse in my head that is out of place, like an out of place hair on my head. I've got a synapse in my head that makes me say Oaks when I'm thinking Holland and Holland when I'm thinking Oaks. 
But regardless, it was one of those two who talked about good, better, and best. That was the name of the talk, right? And how good can be the enemy of better and better can be the enemy of the best. If you think you're doing good enough, then you won't be motivated to do any better. And hence, the good is the enemy of the best. It's important for me to realize that the opposite of that is also true with some personality types like mine. And that is that the best can be the enemy of the good. Which is, if I don't think I can do the very best job, then I won't even do anything at all. And that's what I have to fight against. So it is true, certainly, that the good can be the enemy of the best. But on the flip side, the best can be the enemy of the good. Here's another question I did not respond to in the AMA. It must have come in late. Do GAs and apostles or any stake priesthood, stake president level leaders contact you? Are there many who are... P-I-M-O, physically in, mentally out, at that level who confide in you. I will tell you, no, there are not. I would let you know if there were those who contacted me, though I probably would not mention their names, but no, there are not. I do not have an inside scoop on high-level individuals contacting me and confiding in me, their lack of belief. And finally, if you could go back and change anything from your debate with Kwaku and the boys, what would you change? My answer, I would have said... I hope you're not wearing those bulletproof vests on account of me, because from where I'm sitting, I have a clean headshot on all three of you. And now some other questions that came in well after the AMA was over, but maybe I can get around to trying to answer them here. First question, evidence suggests, and many experts agree, that your podcast is helping thousands of people. Okay, number one, what single doctrine, event, or example is most damaging to the truth claims of the church? Well, I will answer that right now by saying that completely depends upon the person who is discovering it. It is surprising to many people that a member who finds out that Joseph Smith translated the book of Mormon by putting a seer stone into a hat can be jolted from their faith to the point that they will leave the church. And usually that's because, well, it was already supernatural enough anyway that Joseph Smith is translating by the gift and power of God, whatever that means, from the gold plates. Why is it any crazier to change the story and update the story and tell the historically correct story that Joseph Smith did not actually do that. He translated with his seer stone in a hat. And I can't answer that for everybody. I know that my very best friend in the 1980s got thrown for a loop and left the church over precisely that issue. I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that there is a feeling that the church has been hiding this from the members. I don't know because maybe, well, it has. And there can be a certain sense of betrayal or maybe it's just that this is just too outlandish for them to swallow. You'd have to ask the person themselves, I think. And on the other hand, I have a person who's a friend who's still a very active member in the church. He's a great guy. And we talk about things frequently that are messy issues in the church. He's a regular listener to the podcast and he maintains his faith by seeing it in a faithful way. But even this person was rocked, I believe, rocked by the disclosure that general authorities made upwards of $100,000 base salary a few years ago. And I think that's because we're all raised with the idea that there is no paid ministry in the LDS church. We're raised with that idea because that's what the leaders tell us. And because they tell us this, we believe it. And then when we find out that the apostles and 70, at least the first quorum of the 70, make six-figure salaries, base salaries, that can tend to throw us for a loop. The thing that surprised me is that whether it was Fanny Alger or The Rock in the Hat or the Book of Abraham, or any of a number of other things, or polygamy, right, that tend to throw members for a loop, did not throw this particular friend of mine for a loop, at least not as he expressed it to me. But this one thing about the salary, the modest stipend, as President Hinckley called it, the modest stipend of a six-figure base salary that the general authorities get, that threw my friend for a loop, but only for a period of time, a short period of time. And then he got back into the regular apologetic tropes of, well, this is not much compared to other people who lead corporations, you know, that kind of thing. And so what I take away from that is you can never tell what it is that's going to impact a person's testimony. Okay, back to question number two. Many believing members have seen their faith rocked by lesser known events and people from Nancy Rigdon, Lowry Nelson, and Warren Snow. Wow, I know the first two. I'm sorry, I don't know the third. And Warren Snow to curse circles in the temple and the original purpose of garments. In your opinion, what is the most underrated church history topic 
slash event. I am going to answer that by saying I think it's the transfiguration of Brigham Young. I think that's hugely underrated. And it's hugely underrated because when it's presented in church, it is never presented as a miraculous event that nobody at the time who was present made a contemporaneous record of it. And those who were present and did make contemporaneous records of the meeting on August 8th, 1844, mentioned that Brigham Young talked and what he talked about, but said nothing whatsoever about him sounding like Joseph Smith or looking like Joseph Smith. In other words, in every contemporaneous record of the event, nobody says there was a transfiguration. This is something that started popping up many years after the fact and then got accepted by multiple repetitions. And once one person, who I believe was Orson Hyde, mentioned seeing it and experiencing it, then more and more members who were present began remembering that they saw it too. The reason I think this is underrated is because it gives me a window, as I said earlier, as to how quickly a miracle that did not happen can be created in the public consciousness. And then through repetition, it can be accepted as historical fact. As I say, this is something that really opened my eyes and made me look at every other miraculous story in the LDS church, as well as in the Christian church and in the Old Testament with new eyes. Are the stories written there of miraculous events things that really happened or things that people remembered after the event, like the transfiguration of Brigham Young. And finally, question three, are you available Saturday at 9 a.m.? You have been assigned to clean church bathrooms. <laughs> well, the answer to that is yes, I am available and no, I'm not gonna be cleaning church bathrooms. Not anymore. I figure if the LDS church has over $100 billion in the bank, they can afford to hire people to clean their own bathrooms. Thank you very much. Next question. Hey, RFM, your podcast was a lifeboat for me when I jumped off of the dilapidated dinghy of the old ship Zion. Thank you for your work. As a comment about the Brad Wilcox debacle, I think it would be wise for you to investigate and understand how it isn't just the message that Brad Wilcox put forward that is offensive, but also the language. The more empathetic side of humanity is shifting toward human-centered language. This includes saying black people instead of the blacks, and things like that. It's not just that he had racist messaging. It's also a problem that he spoke like a racist. Another time this comes up when discussing how the church discriminated against black members in denying them saving ordinances and exaltation. Sometimes we say priesthood ban as if it encapsulates that whole problem. Don't get pulled into the weeds by apologists who want to focus on anything but the innate racism and sexism perpetuated by the church and its leaders. In response to this, um, I'm not sure it's a question, but I will say that one of the things that really surprised me a few years ago was when I realized not only that it was a priesthood ban, but it was also a temple ban on black women and men or anybody who even has a drop of black blood in them, right? That was the language and the nature of the curse, at least up until 1978. But it really struck me that it was one thing to not allow black men to be ordained to the priesthood, but also to have a building, a physical structure considered to be the most sacred structures in the LDS church, i.e. the temples where no black people could enter. They actually could have had a sign out front saying no blacks allowed. In fact, there figuratively was a sign out front saying no blacks allowed on LDS temples up until 1978. And when that idea occurred to me, it helped me see more than I had seen before how pervasive the racism was of the LDS church. And as this commenter has said, I am not sure they're past it yet. And the reason they're not past it yet is because they refuse to deal with it. All the church leaders want to do is have it fade into the past and be forgotten. But you can't do that if you have not dealt with the issue, if you have not answered the question of who was behind the racist policy. Was it God or was it the leaders of the church? Now, the Gospel Topics essay on the subject tries to have it both ways and puts both forward as possibilities and leaves it to the reader to make their own decision. However, in more recent talks since the essay was published in 2013, we have had at least Elder Oaks at the 2018 B1 celebration come out very clearly as a member of the First Presidency that this was God's ban. It wasn't the leaders of the church. The leaders of the church were all pained about it. And in fact, Elder Oaks cried when he found out that it had been lifted. 
So it wasn't the leaders. No, this was God. This was God all along. And Elder Oaks makes a big point of saying that it wasn't because of any of the theories that church leaders put forward that blacks couldn't have the priesthood. He doesn't delineate what those theories are, but I think we all know it's a lack of valiancy in the premortal existence and or the curse of Cain. But Elder Oaks says that he was never able to get a confirmation from the Spirit that any of those theories was true. Nevertheless, he trusted in the prophets that this was from God. And that was the message that he wanted to convey to the audience. It was really interesting to me to listen to him because at the same time that he was addressing this big audience that was there for the B1 celebration, his overarching message was, we don't discriminate against blacks anymore. Blacks can be members of the church in full standing. And now the black people can join us in the church in discriminating against gay people. Another question asks, what do you think of Joseph Smith's polygamy? My answer is, I think that it was abhorrent. And I think that a lot of people would agree with me. I think a lot of people thought it was abhorrent at the time, but a lot of people, even though they had those feelings, still went along with it because they believed that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God and that polygamy is what God wanted them to do. From a more objective point of view, I think that Joseph Smith was a creative and charismatic individual. And as often as not, what accompanies creativity and charisma, at least in men, is frequently a very, very strong sex drive, which can manifest itself in ways that are outside of the societal norms. I sometimes think of Joseph Smith as the Bill Clinton of Mormonism. And by that, I mean a person who has charm and charisma, but apparently more of a sex drive than would be good for them, or at least expressed in ways that are not good for them, and certainly not good for the people that they abuse. I also think that the polygamy was about sex, but it was also about power. And it was a way for Joseph Smith to extend his power over his membership. I sometimes wonder if this was a way of his testing his members to see how much power he had over them and how much allegiance they had to him. And I think that in far too many instances, Joseph Smith found that his followers were willing to sacrifice everything to him up to and including their own daughters and wives, if necessary. Now the last question, the real last question. Hi, RFM. I presume you heard or are aware of Denver Snuffer's end-all and be-all explanation of the book of Abraham that he described in a lengthy discourse sometime after your epic discussions with Professor Rittner on Mormon stories. Have you listened to or studied Denver's explanation, and would you care to share your thoughts on it? I will tell you that I am aware that he gave a lengthy address and wrote a lengthy paper, I should say, dealing with the subject that he did that, i.e. Denver Snuffer. So really, I can't comment on the, the details of what Denver's explanation is. I think that if Denver's explanation is that the book of Abraham is scripture and that it doesn't have to match up with aspects of ancient Egypt, in other words, if it looks more like apocrypha than a real historical document, if that society comes down on, then I have no problem with that. And I, I think that Robert Rittner expressed his opinion that he has no problem with people thinking that it's scripture or thinking that it has value separate and apart from a connection with ancient Egypt. His main problem was when people such as his former student, John Gee, go out and pretend that the book of Abraham actually is an ancient document and then bastardize the Egyptology that Rittner was at least partially responsible for inculcating in John Gee. They used that Egyptology in order to support a 19th century work of frontier fiction as if it were actually ancient. So hopefully at some point I'll be able to get to that. I am really, really surprised by the number of things I haven't been able to get into as much as I would like, but that's because of the demands of time and also because of the fact that Mormonism is like an octopus. It has tentacles that reach out into so many different areas. It has tentacles that reach out into DNA studies, into archaeology studies, into botanical studies, into Egyptology, into Old Testament studies, into New Testament studies, into 19th century America historical studies. And here I know I'm just scratching the surface. And of course, I shouldn't forget psychology and sociology and group religious dynamics. There are so many things about Mormonism that touch on so many other subjects. It's one of the things that makes it so fascinating, but at the same time, make it virtually impossible for any one human being to be an expert on everything related to Mormonism. It is a subject that I know will wear me out long before 
I wear it out. And it's one of the reasons that I have come to understand that even though I've been podcasting for over five years now, there is still so much more to talk about that I will never get to it all. And that's just talking about the history. On top of the history is the current things that the LDS Church does because at least every month or so, the LDS Church will have something happen or some leader make a talk like Brad Wilcox that simply demands to be commented on and analyzed. And although I will never be able to say everything I want to say about Mormonism, at least by resurrecting the Radio Free Mormon podcast and backing off of my legal practice in order to accommodate that into my schedule, I will be able to talk about more of the things related to Mormonism that I could not do in the past year. I want to thank all of you among my listeners who have donated to the show. Your donations make all the difference in the world. Without your donations, I would not be able to keep this podcast going. I will conclude by saying I had a wonderful time at the Ask Me Anything on Mormon Reddit. I want to thank all the people who took the time to ask me questions and express their feelings to me. I hope that my answers were sufficient in some regard, and I had a great time. I hope you did too. That's about all for tonight. Until next time, this is Radio Free Mormon, signing off the air.